Um, could you, before you start to speak, uh, say to whom you are addressing, which of the speakers you are addressing your remarks? Thank you. Yeah. My, my, re my <laughs> remark is to Wolfgang. Thanks very much for your presentation. I agree it's essential to distinguish natural and uh, legal rights. Uh, and, and natural rights ordinarily apply to entities with personhood. However, we sometimes apply natural rights to collective entities, family sometimes on some accounts, certain kinds of communities are thought to have natural rights. Uh, so why is it that, an, I mean, and a robot is a kind of, it's a collection. Why, what, what about that, that, that unity that the unity characters of a robot, why is it not like other sorts of collective unities that, that might have natural rights? And then the other, the other point is, the question is, I sometimes wonder whether we should assign legal rights to robots, not for the good of the robot, for the good of ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like going back to my son Andreas, uh, you know, abusing Siri, speaking, you know, it was for his good that I wanted him to stop. So, uh, and there's a, in a robot there's like a spark of ourselves, not the silicone part, but the intelligence part, it derives from ourselves. So, could it be for our own good that we want robots to have uh, legal rights? Thank you very much for that. I would like to keep in contact with you on that issue. I have to be very brief right sure, now. Sure. Well, I think it depends upon the culture where you live, how you see this issue. For example, if you go to Japan, uh, there is the Kozeki system, and that is family law, and people in Japan are thinking about treating robots as a part of a family, and they could Imagine that robots could be registered in a kind of a family register, and there might be robots with a small R and robots with a capital R. And they can be registered, and so they have a different status. The problem still remains uh, as regards accountability, responsibility. I don't know about the Japanese views about this, but in uh, Germany, at least, people are very, very uh, reluctant. I don't know about... Uh, other countries, but throughout Europe, I think there is a great skepticism regarding this. But one can say that it is techni technically and maybe philosophically also completely possible uh, to figure or to, to just think about a robot with a legal personality that does not mean having human rights, but just Rome. Uh, robot rights and you are registered, you have an ID number. And so if this robot with the, ID, uh, with the ID number does any wrong, one can track who is, who is responsible also for what the robot has done. But the problem is if we, uh, if we could keep a consistency in our ethics that we have so far, if we were to start to concede uh, rights or legal personality to robots. And that is a discussion. I'm not sure what is the right answer, but I'm reluctant as long as we don't have much empirical evidence on how people communicate and how people relate to robots and what does that make with them, especially with children. I would like to wait a bit. Maybe we should have mm. a moratorium on some of the basic issues and yeah. just wait and then decide. Mm. Thank you. Stefano. Yes, I have a couple of questions for Amy. Right from the beginning, your presentation, you ask yourself, what is the responsibility? It seems to me that you are referring to the traditional notion of responsibility, namely responsibility as imputability or accountability and liability. But as you certainly know, in the last few decades, a new notion of responsibility is emerging, namely responsibility as taking care, which means that I am responsible not only for what I do wrongly, but also for what I do not do when I was in a position to do. Now, this is, as you know, a, a, a notion that, for instance, Pope Francis keeps on repeating every single moment. In other words, uh, it's more responsible when you do not do 
than when you do. Second remark, you talked about a attribution of responsibility. I'm sure that you, you know the notion of a, a diaphoric responsibility. For instance, markets are an, a, an adiaphoric mechanism which generates dilution of responsibility. Now, don't you think that also ro robotization is today another form of adiaphoric mechanism whereby actions are performed, consequences are derived, but at the end of the day, Nobody is responsible, or better to say, many people are responsible for such a limited amount that at the end nobody responds. That is the, show no, the notion of dilution of responsibility. How would you cope with that aspect, which is today increasing? Thank you. Thank you for, for both of those questions. Um, I, I also, I like this idea of responsibility as taking care. And in some of the work by Ibo Vanderpool, he talks about uh, forward-looking responsibility, and we can look at that as responsibility as obligation or responsibility as virtues. So this idea of cultivating character traits, rather than focusing on actions and the outcomes of actions, focusing on responsibility in so far as it's about character traits of the individual. And I think that is that can still be woven into the e-waste discussion as well. We can think about uh, procurement officers or you know, and how they have, yes, there is consequences to their action and they should be searching for alternatives, but perhaps procurement officers should also be the ones to stand up and say, look, we have to do something about this. You know, th there isn't anything out there, and so it's up to us to do something about this. I would also say that there's a responsibility for ethicists in this space, <laughs> that I'm also trying to be someone to say, we have to do something about this as a form of, you know, my own sort of uh, virtues or, or this push to sort of take care of. And then, really great point about at the end of the day, uh, nobody is responsible. And for this, I would um, point to the work of Deborah Johnson, who talks about you know, the vision that we have, the vision that we create with technology. And we have to understand that robots, and artificial intelligence for that matter, isn't something in nature that we are discovering. You know, it's not this thing that, oh wow, th this is so cool, we found this new species. We create it. We get to decide. Who is responsible? And yes, it could be little bits here, little bits there, and so at the end of the day, it's too difficult, but that's something that we choose. We could also say, no, the consequences are so dire, climate change is, should be at the top of everyone's priority list right now, that we're not going to allow any more for people to just not be responsible. So I agree that that is a, a mode of thinking, but we get to change that. And I think we should. I think we have a responsibility to change that. But it, it's the implication of what you just said, that we have total responsibility. I mean, what about the self-adaptation introduced into AIs by themselves and the learning introduced yep. by themselves? Why should we, humans, take responsibility for the consequences of that? Because we've decided to make it. We've decided to make these systems that are capable of self-adaptation. And we've decided to broaden the limits or the scope with which, within which they can adapt. If we want to say we don't feel comfortable with having technologies that can adapt or optimize to the extent that we no longer know what they would do in a situation, then that's a decision that we've made and we should be responsible and held accountable to, for making that decision. And would you advocate the same attitude towards the children that we have? So legally, morally or legally? <laughs> because we also understand that, that with children, we have, we have responsibility for the consequences of their actions until they grow up in this world, until they learn enough about this world, and then they take over responsibility. But that's also because they are born as moral agents with the understanding that they will take on these responsibilities in the future. So we are stewards of them for a certain amount of time. No, they are not born as moral agents. They are born as beings 
with the capacity in potentia to right. become moral agents. Moral patience, I should have said. They're moral patience, a part of our moral community. No, it's not the agent and patient that I was uh, quibbling with. Uh, it's, we are born with all sorts of capacities for loving, for walking, for talking, mm. um, for speaking, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, but they're all in potentia. Mm -hmm. They don't exist as such at birth, mm -hmm. and they won't unless we have um, very good relationships with all the orders of reality, the natural, uh, the cultural heritage, uh, and the social. All mm -hmm. three of them have to be right within a very pretty tight margin mm -hmm. for all to go well. Mm -hmm. with this being. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're confronted with here is something quite different. We don't know what the potentials are of what we have produced. Mm -hmm. So can we always shrug off moral responsibility for unintended consequences? Sorry, can we always shrug off our moral responsibility yeah. for their unintended consequences? For the unintended, for the consequences, unintended of the consequences of the things that we have created, things or beings that we have created. Yeah. So I don't think we should ever shrug it off. No, I agree. <laughs> but maybe it's not our responsibility to do anything with. <laughs> practically at the moment. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my question is for you. Uh, you started by explaining that there were uh, various kinds of intelligence and hence we could not give rights to robots because their kind of intelligence is very different from ours. But I wonder if your argument does not presuppose that you get rights because you're intelligent. And if we see among the humans, there are some humans that are very intelligent and some humans whose intelligence is very close to zero, but I think that we agree that it's a good thing that they have the same right, whatever their intelligence is. So intelligence is by no means the ground on which we get rights. Well, thank you for, for the criticism. Well, we, maybe I've not been very clear on this. That was just a prima facie issue. I just wanted to show that at first glance, one would not have spontaneously the idea one should immediately give rights to robots, since this is such a different world still, at least. But I'm with you. I think that rationality, but also vulnerability, is one big issue, at least at a moral level, to think about giving rights to moral patients and moral agents. But the vulnerability thing is very tricky as regards embedded AI systems. If we could <laughs> provide for robots feeling pain, that should or that must have been then our decision to design robots that could feel pain. Uh, one could also say that this is so immoral. Why do you want to uh, have robots that can suffer? It's enough that human beings can suffer. Why do you have this spill over into the robot world? And, and that's a point that, at least in my view, comes or adds to the issue of intelligence or rationality. Vulnerability, and if you are vulnerable, you have to be protected also by rights. And so I think we are not really in a dissensus there. No. Okay, Marcus. Oh, you have, okay. Then we have Henry and that, that's the list. There is some problem at the airport for anybody who has not heard this. Um, this is why we're getting drift from people who are desperate to get their planes or try to. Um, so 
we're just going to take um, this uh, last question from Henry. Uh, where, oh, Henry. Oh, he's gone. He had to go to the airport. He had to go to the airport, right. There is a problem. So, but I doubt if anybody can uh, improve it by going to the airport. Um, uh, yeah, let me briefly say, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, some have to, had to go out because they were asked to come early to the airport because of some security matters there. Ah. And that's why some colleagues left. So they didn't leave because of any <laughs> paper or discussion. Had distressed them. <laughs> Right, so we'll wait now for coffee until we've got two more papers to come, plus our discussion of um, our conclusions. Um, so should we be back here, should we take 20 minutes and be back here at 10 to 5? Yeah. 10 to 5, everybody. Good, thank you.